Well, hello there and welcome to the Dana Spencer Show, where we talk about solving problems, building relationships, quitting corporate, and the freedom to walk in our God-given purpose. So I hope you are feeling amazing. You've got the activity of your limbs. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm super glad today because I have an amazing guest with me today. So and I am not going to belabor the point. So give a warm Dana Spencer welcome to Coach Keith Eckloff. Woo! Welcome to the show, Keith. How are we feeling today? Feeling great. Feeling great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know you are a busy man, so we are going to just jump right on in. So tell us, as a little boy, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> um. When I was a little boy, I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist. I thought that that was going to be my path to to help people through their struggles in life and uh, and make a difference in the world. Wow. So I think that wasn't the reality. So what ended up happening after you had that dream? And then you're like, tell us about that path. Well, you know, I've I've shifted paths a a couple of times along the way. Um, And, uh, you know, I got got to college and I'm thinking about the idea of going to medical school to be a psychiatrist. And, um, you know, I wasn't loving those those science classes at that level. And I said, well, maybe this is maybe this isn't the path for me. Um, And so I shifted gears in college and um, decided that I I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, And um, I went to law school at the University of Maryland. Um, and um, practiced law for six years. Um, I did primarily um, divorce law, um, and um, I just I just didn't didn't love it. I, it wasn't it wasn't having the impact that I hoped I could have on the world um, as, as a divorce attorney. So um, you know, I shifted gears again. <laughs> so. Um, <clears throat> In uh, in 2004, uh, I was I was practicing law. I've been practicing for about six years, um, and uh, I had a one year old at home. And uh, I would come home late, working long, long hours, uh, and uh, unhappy. Uh, and uh, I was so jealous that my wife got to stay home with the baby, and that they were enjoying this this wonderful time. Um, and and she joked with me. She was she would always joke. Well, if you if you want to, you can move to Louisville where my family is and, and I'll go to work and you can be a stay at home dad. And, um, you know, after a couple of weeks, she, you know, her making this joke, I finally came home and said, if you're kidding, you have to stop because I'm getting ready to call your bluff, you know? Um, and, and that's what we did in 2004. Uh, we, we made a, a complete shift. Uh, I became a stay at home dad. Uh, we moved to Louisville, which was her hometown from my hometown. Um, and, um, Uh, That's when I began uh, coaching. Wow. So tell me where your hometown was again. Uh, I grew up in Rockville, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. So quite a bit of a transition from Maryland to Louisville. So what was the biggest transition from you moving from Maryland to to Louisville, Kentucky? Um, I I guess as much as this is a city, it is it is definitely a small community community. Uh, and so, you know, I, I wasn't used for that, used to that. And, and geographically, the, this Louisville's not much more south, southern than uh, Washington is. Uh, but in terms of the way people behave and the way they treat each other, uh, this is definitely much more of a southern city. Uh, people are much more friendly. Um, they greet one another. Um, if you pass a stranger, uh, it's not uncommon to greet them. Hi, how are you? Smile at them. Uh, if you did that in the town I grew up in, they would look at you like, what's wrong with you? Well, and I have to ask you this because everybody who is not from here, I ask this question. So did you feel like Louisville was cliquish? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I was blessed to be around a lot of really good people. Um, so I, I don't think I felt that as much as maybe some others that I've heard talk about it. But, um, but uh, everybody sort of has their... Their, their sort of network. I, my favorite illustration of that is the way that uh, everyone, when they first meet you, they want to know what high school you went to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that is so crazy. And what I've found is 
other places when people ask you what school, they refer to college and not high school. Whereas here, nobody cares what college you went to. Correct. <laughs> so you moved here from Maryland to Louisville, Kentucky. And did you have you didn't have any coaching background, any athletic background, or did you play athletics in in high school and college? I, I did not play in college. I, I played a little bit in high school. I played played a lot of youth league ball over the years. And, um, you know, I was a football guy from the very beginning. That was the only sport we really, really watched in my house. Um, and so that was that was my first love. Um, and when uh, we made this decision to move, um, my wife asked me a brilliant question. You know, um, I, I was telling her that I wasn't really happy practicing law. I wasn't having the impact that I thought I would be able to have on these families. and um, she, she asked me, uh, what is it that you're doing that you love? And uh, I, I was volunteering and coaching football at our local church league team, uh, little kids. Um, and I really felt like I was having more impact on those kids that I was seeing for a couple hours in the evening than I was on the families that I was uh, had dedicated my profession to trying to help. Um, and so... You know, just with that with that one question, you know, she's like, well, OK, if this is what you love, how do we turn this into a job? How do we turn this into a way that you can um, have a profession that's fulfilling that you're going to love? Um, and so, you know, when we moved here, uh, you know, I, I, I literally I didn't know anyone in the coaching community in Louisville, not, not a soul. And I didn't even really know the schools. Um, so I wrote letters to a few coaches and said, you know, can I help? What can I do? And um, you know, was able to was able to get on staff and, and get started. Well, and I don't want to gloss over the fact that your wife sounds like a very wise woman asking these questions. So I have to ask, what is her profession? She's an occupational therapist. Um, she does home health. OK, I just had to because she have you noticed the trend here that she's asked some very powerful questions that has really pivoted your career? Absolutely. Absolutely. She's um, she's she's. Uh, she's my rock for sure. And to have that type of confidence, because a lot, I'm thinking about a lot of women who would not have even offered that as an option. Okay. Or her husband is, you know, going through a lot and is very unhappy. I'm sure you were bringing that into the home, but some women probably would have been like, you know what, you're paying the bills and I'm staying home with the child and I'm not even going to offer that. So kudos to your wife for even giving you that option. So high five to her. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So you um, you write letters to the coaches and then you've never coached before. But what was what was your first job after having written those letters? Uh, I was an assistant uh, freshman coach at Ballard High School. Uh, Mark Cat Mark Catlett gave me a chance to coach there. Um, and, um, you know, I just we moved in on. Uh, july 9th and we started practice on july 10th wow and i'm gonna have to put a pin in this because i forgot to ask you law school i have a friend of mine two of her sons one of them is um studying for the bar right now and the other one is um has taken the lsat and i also had a conversation with um coach Car coach tarver over at fisk university coaching gymnastics she too went to law school and is no longer in law school. So what was it about being an attorney, a lawyer that just wasn't quite fulfilling for you? Do you know what that was? I do. It's, it's a little hard to explain briefly, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, every, um, every person in law school just about believes they are going to, uh, they're going to change the world. And we all have different ideas of how we're going to do that. Uh, but the, these uh, they're, they're pouring themselves into this education, which is a wonderful education. Um, and they believe that uh, that they're going to be able to make significant changes. A, a large number of people in law school. My thought process was that as a society, uh, we have so many um, uh, kids that are growing up with parents who aren't together anymore. Um, and that because of the way we handle this this sort of separation and child support and all those kinds of things, they end up angry with one another. And it makes it really difficult for them to be uh, the kind of parents they could otherwise be. Uh, and I thought if I could guide them through this process in a way that keeps them focused on their children, 
that, uh, you know, we could eliminate some of the animosity and they would be able, uh, as they got through the other side, they'd be able to parent better together. That was, that was my goal. Um, what happens is that, that works for some people and, and you'll have some clients who come through and they listen and they are able to solve their problems and they're successful and it's great. Um, but let's say if you have 10 clients in a month and five of them are that way, then the next month you're going to have 10 clients that are the other way because you've kept those five from the previous month. And so those people tend to be more angry and they're doing self-destructive things and they're doing things that are destructive to their children, even though they say that the children are their priority. Um, and as the months go by, you collect those people uh, and the people that are that you're really successful with move on um, and they they don't need you anymore. They go about their lives. And so what happens is you really collect uh, a group of clients that are that were you know, quite angry. And so uh, as as far as like going into work every day, uh, it, it's tough. You know, when you're you're it, just by na the nature of the business, you're dealing with people in their worst moments. Uh, the hardest time of their life. Um, and then to deal with the ones who were not really able to effectively deal with it all the time. Uh, it just it just wore on me. And I didn't feel like I, I was I was really successful in, in impacting their lives positively. Yeah, so I, I just couldn't gloss over that, especially with the friends that I have. And this is the second time um, attorney term coach. So I just I just had to kind of dig in there. So, OK, so you're um, assistant at Ballard. So how is that having to, you know, you're not from here, you don't know anybody here. And how are you able to build trust with the athletes? Well, um, one of the things I found out quickly is uh, the worst thing you can possibly do in dealing with young athletes is to be fake. Uh, you have to be genuine. You have to be yourself. You have to be real. Um, as much as they're going through other issues or whatever, uh, at least I've found the, the kids that I've coached over the years are truth detectors. Uh, they, if you're not true, tr your true self with them, they will, they'll see through it in a heartbeat. Um, and so, um, you know, for me, sort of my method of connecting with kids has always been to be myself um, and to be that consistent person in their life that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the coolest guy they know, uh, but I'm the guy they can depend on. Everything that I tell them will be true. Everything I say I'm going to do, I do. I love that, that they're the truth detector. That that definitely is one of the main things that young people, if you're not authentic, like you said, they, they, they're they able to detect what, that like a mile away. Yes. And if they sense it in you, then they won't listen to anything you say. You know, so if, if you're being fake in this area, then that diminishes your credibility in all aspects of your relationship with them. Absolutely. So how long would you stay at Ballard? I was at Ballard just one year that that time. I come back later. Uh, okay. But I uh, I went to um, Seneca for three years with um, Coach Lewis Dover, uh, who was a good mentor to me. And um, I started as the head freshman coach. And then uh, I became a varsity uh, assistant with him. And um, uh, at the end of three years, uh, I went back to Ballard. Um, when Coach Mike Jackson got the job there, uh, and I was the offensive coordinator there for six years um, and uh, learned a lot from him. And then um, I went to Mail uh, for five years with Coach Chris Wolf, who's outstanding uh, and really was a, a, a big influence on my coaching career and, and um, sort of the way I do things. Um, and then uh, I took the head football coaching job at Seneca, and I was there for the last five years. So how are you able to to learn? What are some things if somebody is out there listening and they are an attorney or some other profession and they've always wanted to, to become a coach? Like they love football. They love young people. They're true. They're authentic. What are some things that you would recommend that they do in order to to take that leap of faith and really do something that they'll be passionate about? Well, the first thing I would say is to make sure that you have uh, the time to enter into this this commitment, uh, because I think the worst thing you can do is sort of give yourself to it halfway. Um, I, there are going to be kids in every group on every team who are very um, sort of needy in terms of they need 
uh, role models. They need relationships uh, and, and they need to know that you're there for them. Um, and so one of the things that I was really blessed with, especially early, uh, is that uh, because of the, the agreement that my wife and I made, uh, we had time. I had time uh, and I was able to devote time uh, to those relationships um, and to those kids. Um, but as far as like, you know, if you if you've decided, OK, I've got I've got the time. Uh, I feel like I have the talent and I really want to do this kind of thing. Uh, I would say that the, the, the first step is to, to just reach out to somebody in the community and find a spot um, where uh, you can be useful, you know, to the program. Uh, I think a lot of times, uh, especially younger coaches or new coaches, they chase they chase titles. Um, and I did it. You know, um, I, I want to be uh, a varsity coach or I want to be a coordinator. I want to be I want this job title. Um and one of the things that Coach Wolf taught me was that um, it, it's better, better, better to let the title come after, let the title reflect the work that you're doing. Um, and so, you know, when when he hired me, he said, "I, I don't know what what your position is going to be. I'm going to keep giving you jobs, and as long as you do them as well or better than I can do them, you get to keep doing them." And um, you know, I found out that first year that I was the offensive coordinator, not because he told me, but because I saw it in the program. I just every time he gave me a job, I tried to do it as well or better than I thought he would do it, um, which was a pretty high standard. So, um, you know, I was always sort of pushing myself to make sure whatever uh, he gave me to do, I was going to do it uh, to the best of my ability. Um, and I think for young coaches, that that's really the key is to try to excel at each piece that you're able to to influence. So how, what I'm hearing is, is worth work ethic. So how important is it for you to have a good work ethic as a coach? I, I think it, I think it's everything. Uh, I, I really do. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people out here who know a lot about sports, uh, know a lot about um, technique, know a lot about uh, what they watch and, and can describe it. Uh, but if, if you're not going to put in the work to really see it, uh, to really know what's going on, to watch film, to um, interact with your players and those kinds of things. Uh, you, you're just you're just not going to be successful. And, um, you know, I, I, I coached with someone a while back who used to used to say on Friday nights, you know, during the game, he would see something from the opponent and be like, he's doing this every time. I can see it. I can see it. And I said, man, I wish you had told me that when we were watching film, when we were preparing, you know, to get to this moment, because you know, the week of us being able to teach our kids has gone has gone by, you know, and so you have to put that work in in advance. Right. So that you can make use of all of those talents of observing things and, and um, you know, planning. This is what we should do as a result of what we're seeing. Right. Uh, you need to see that stuff in advance so that you can prepare your team. Yeah, I don't know why this popped in my head, but I believe it was the Detroit Lions official. Um, offensive coordinator that says he created his program based off of the strength of the athletes. Would you agree with that? Or what, what are your thoughts on just hearing that? Oh, I would absolutely agree with that. I, I think you, you can have um, a, you know, an offense or a defensive structure that you like, or, or uh, a, a way of communicating really an offense is really just a way of communicating. Um, you, you can have the, the verbs that you verbiage that you like to use. Uh, but what you choose to to put in with a given unit uh, had, had better be tailored to your group. Um, so at, at Mail in uh, 2015, uh, we won a state championship. We were a top 10 nationally ranked team. Uh, we had an outstanding group of players. And um, but that offense looked very different than the offense just a couple of years later in 2018 when we won state again. Um, totally different players, totally different strengths. Um, we didn't change our system, so to speak. Like the kids didn't know we had really changed the offense. But if you just watch those two teams, uh, what they did were totally different from one to the next. So and I, you you coached at Ballard, you coached at Seneca, you coached at Mail, and, and now you're about to coach at Manuel. Are the Kids different at those different schools because you know Mel had a very traditional program, a lot of structure, and maybe Seneca didn't have as much. And then your manual are the is it important for the kids to like buy into the process here, or are you able to help the children to like 
figure it out so that they buy into your process, regardless of, you know, their background and where they're coming from. Yeah. I, you know, at, at the beginning, you asked, are, are the children different in place to place? And um, I, I want to give you two answers and they're the exact opposite. Uh, in many ways, uh, they're different. Um, the, uh, the the way that, you know, meeting the, the players at Manual, uh, they come up, they make eye contact, they can shake your hand, they um, know how to introduce themselves. They have all of these sort of um, social skills. I had a lot fewer of my players um, at Seneca that did that when I got there. Um, and so in some senses, uh, you know, the average player, I guess, or the, the you know, most of the players um, have a lot of differences in sort of the the, uh, the resources that are available to them, the, the training that they've had coming into it, their social skills, those kinds of things. Um, so in that sense, yes, they're, they're, they're different different groups are, are always um, different. Um, but, you know, kids in a lot of ways are the same wherever you go. Um, and so, you know, that that comment I made earlier about being truth detectors, I think that's true at every stop I've been at, um, whether those, those kids are high academic kids or lower academic kids, whether they're, um, you know, from sort of wealthy families or lower socioeconomic statuses, uh, whatever sort of background they're from. Um, you know, I, I've just found that to be the case, that that authenticity and those kinds of things um, are important. Um, as far as, um, you know, starting at Manual now, um, you know, we've been together now for a few weeks and I'm, I'm just really starting to get to know these guys. Um, but uh, what I'm what I'm finding is is now I have to you know, you have to build those relationships again. Um, when it comes down to it as a coach, my power, my authority over the team um, comes from those relationships, right? Uh, I, I have I have it under my control. I have playing time, right? So, I, you know, you can always take away playing time or reward kids with playing time. Uh, but other than that, um, really, uh, whether the team is going to do what I want them to do, whether they're going to be the kind of team that I see us being, really comes down to the relationships that we build. So in terms of strategy, because um, I don't know how many seniors you have on on your roster, but you don't have a whole lot of time because, you know, a lot of times you're like, oh, I have four years to develop this team or whatever. But for the seniors, you know, this is their last year. You're a brand new coach. What are some of the strategies that you plan to implement in order to to build that trust rel relatively quickly? Yeah, I, I mean, really, it, it comes down to putting in the time with guys and, um, you know, we'll we'll make it a point over the course of these first few months over the course of this summer especially when we're all together uh to do some sort of team building relationship kinds of things uh but a lot of it is about them trusting the work and them trusting the plan um and so you know one of the things is you know it's easy to tell people what to do um it, but you'll get a lot more success if you can convince them why they want to do it you know not just that they want to do what you said, but that there's a that there's a purpose to what you're asking them to do. That there's a reason this technique is right. Uh, that there's a reason that that this play fits within the scheme of your offense, um, as opposed to just you know things that are randomly thrown together. Um, and and that you know there's there's no easy there's no easy road to that. Uh, uh, but we're we're blessed at, at Manual because um, this is not a rebuild situation. So like you said, we don't have to wait four years. You know, we, we can go out and be competitive right away, um, right now. Um, and so and I think I think they're confident in that. I think I think a lot of our players feel like um, that, that there's a much higher ceiling for them than what they've achieved so far. And so so far, it's been great. There's been a, a lot of buy in that that they feel like there's a lot more out there for us to to achieve. So I'm really into communication styles. And so, you know, I, I, I watch a lot of football games and a lot of coaches, and I like to pay attention to how they communicate with their players. So you have some coaches that are like just yellers. They, you know, just I feel like they just yell at everybody. And then you have people who either respond to yelling or they don't respond to yelling at all and they like shut down. So how are you able to figure out the players that you should yell at? The players you should let them you know go sit down and be to themselves or are you the type of coach that just yells at everybody <laughs> i am not a, a huge yeller and screamer uh by nature um and, but and i'll tell you if i do it 
uh, if I try to do it, it comes off as as phony or fake, I, right? Um, and so it's not it's not authentic. It. it doesn't work for me. I am big on consequences. And so, you know, what I'll tell players is, okay, if this happens, this is what, and I won't be upset at all, but this is what the consequence is going to be. And, you know, you make your decision. Either you're going to run off the field when we ask you to, or you're not. And, you know, if not, this is what you'll do instead, you know. Um, but I think it's important on a staff to have a balance of people. Um, I, I've never, I've never been much on coaches that yell just to yell. Uh, I don't think that's productive for any type of learner. Really, um, you know, you'll hear a lot. Coaches yell, hit somebody, uh, you know, block somebody. Uh, believe me, the kid wants to hit someone. Believe me, the player wants to block someone. Uh, we need to be constructive. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not big on coaches that yell to yell, but you do need high energy coaches. Um, and I think players feed off of, of that kind of energy. Um, and so, you know, while I maybe am not. Um, real animated on the sideline. You, you know, you have to have that guy on your staff uh, that is. And, um, you know, if they're a teacher and not a yeller, um, that animation can be a tremendously valuable. Um, and kids feed off of it and um, it, it can raise sort of the whole level. Um, so my big thing as we build a staff is to try to make sure that we have a balance of personalities. And so if you're that kid that doesn't respond to the high energy guy, that, that that player has someone else on the staff that matches their their energy. Yeah, I love that. And so you were on the male side of things for five years, and now you're going to be on the manual side of things. And I'm a manual graduate. <laughs> so go Rams. <laughs> so um, the, the whole male manual rivalry. So. What I've learned is like when I graduated high school, I still didn't like people who went to mail. But as an adult, I'm, I'm having I'm getting over that. I just feel like sometimes with rivalries, it can go too far or it's just another form of division. Do you look at rivalries as being you know, a good thing for the schools and um, it's just healthy competition or are there some people that you know take it too far? Well, it, it, with anything in life. Uh, there are going to be people who take it too far. Uh, whatever good thing out there, uh, if you if you go to the edge, you go all the way to the end, um, you can take these things too far. I am excited to get back to this rivalry. It's just just the coolest thing. I, I, I mean, the uh, the the passion that these two fan bases bring and the, this these two student bodies bring to this game uh, as a as a coach. And hopefully for our players, um, it is it's just fun. Um, and so for us, at the end of our regular season, it's right before the playoffs. And you know, we we want to get to a point where our players can enjoy it and um, you know laugh at it a little bit uh, and feel the energy of the whole thing. Count their blessings to be able to be in a game that this many people really care about. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, of, of the schools that I've been at. Male and manual are the most similar, um, and that's part of what feeds this rivalry. They're two high-achieving academic schools. They're two high-achieving sports schools, um, and so part of the reason that this is a great rivalry is that they're a lot alike. Yeah, I love your perspective. That was really very, very helpful to me, the, the perspective. I know you have a lot of players because, and I've been to, to a lot of football games. So in terms of the ability to play both sides of the ball, do you feel like that that is helpful to, to be able to play both offense and defense or, you know, you know what, I have enough players that I don't hardly ever do that. It's a balancing act. Um, in general, I, if you can um, have most of your players, what we call platoon, play one side of the ball, uh, you're going to double your practice time. Um, so uh, where I was at Seneca and we all had to play both sides of the ball, we might get 15 minutes of individual time. Uh, if you can platoon, now you're going to get 30 minutes of individual time. You're going to you're going to get so many more reps. Um, and so the, the sort of the balancing act is uh, can your player that maybe maybe isn't the isn't the second cornerback, you know, uh, can he help you at receiver 
instead of being your second corner. Maybe he could be a, a, a one at receiver. Um, and the other advantage is, uh, you know, if, if, if people are too far down the depth chart, uh, they feel left out. Um, and so if you're platooning, you know, you're going to have 44 guys that are a one or a two um, and, and really feel like they're contributing. They could play Friday. They're invested in, in your program. Um, and so there, there's a lot of sort of benefits to being platoon and, and manuel has been platoon mostly in the past. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, there, there are some people that they can, they can handle it and they can, they can do both. So, um, you know, when I was at Mayo, we had Nate Hobbs, who's playing for the, the Raiders now. And, um, you know, he was he was primarily a defensive back, but he could come over and run a few routes on offense and be productive. And uh, it didn't take away uh, a ton of practice time. Uh, so my view going into things and I'll, I'll have to I may adjust as I see what we've got. But my view going into things is to be primarily uh, a platoon team where, where people are focused on one side of the football, uh, but to have. Um, some of those players who are uh, exceptional or who are an area of need um, be able to sort of cross over. And maybe they just have a limited package of things that they can do on the other side of the ball. Um, maybe they don't maybe they don't have the whole offense. So uh, I use the example of Nate Hobbs. He didn't he didn't run all the plays, but we had a package of plays for when when we were going to borrow Nate and he was going to go go out and um, he was able to be really, really productive. Um, with sort of a limited number of things that we were that we were doing, um, and so I could see a situation where we're, where we're doing that, um, and you know, taking some of our, our really talented guys and allowing them the opportunity to to play on both sides of the ball. So, what are you able to do in order to get your players exposed to, at the college level? So, are are there anything that you're doing in particular to make sure that some of your your seniors get the exposure that they need, so that you know if they're College Brown, D1, D2, whatever, what are the things that you all are doing at Manual in order to help give them that exposure? Well, I mean, one of the things to be at, at Manual, one of the blessings that we have is it, it seems like every every couple of days there's another college coming by to visit and, and talk with our kids and um, try to build relationships, uh, in part because, you know, we're playing football at a high level, uh, but it's an excellent academic school. Uh, and so these schools know that when they come in, they're going to have uh, players that are able to handle the academic load in their university. They're not going to be there for a year and be struggling and, and drop off the drop off the team because they can't handle um, sort of the academic work. Uh, and so my first thing um, with our kids is, is really we're focused on trying to make sure that our grades are where they need to be uh, because it gives you options. Um, the, the more uh, that you can do in the classroom, the, the greater number of places can take you, the greater number of places can offer you uh, a variety of financial assistance to get there. Uh, I, I don't, from my perspective, it doesn't matter whether that money is a is an academic scholarship, a need-based scholarship, a an athletic scholarship. I just want our kids to be able to go to school in a, in a price that they can afford that's comfortable. And for a lot of kids, hopefully that's free. You know, that, that's what we want. We want them to be able to go to school for free. Um, and so for, you know, when you get outside of, of the big D1 programs, uh, a, a lot of those schools are combining um, financial aid resources with academic resources, with a little bit of sports money. Um, and so uh, the first thing is really getting their grades where they need to be. And that preserves sort of the most options for kids. Um, and then uh, the next thing is really to make sure that, that they have access to as many um, college camps and, and those kinds of environments that they can get into this spring. Uh, we will be doing some training uh, to try to prepare those for the, to prepare our kids for those camps. Um, things that maybe like normally I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about 40 yard dash times for football because we're not going to run any on Friday nights. Uh, but we'll spend some time uh, training those kinds of things to help help our guys. Um, and one of the blessings we have is we have so many uh, multi sport athletes at, at Manual. Um, and so a lot of our guys are are running track. And so they're getting that that training um, on a daily basis from from a really good track coach. Uh, and so that that's sort of the best, uh, the best option. But we're going to make sure that those guys who aren't multi-sport guys um, are, are getting that kind of training. Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing a good job structuring our weight program to make sure that they're getting stronger and that they've got the right mobility and those kinds of things. Um, 
And then uh, I would say the last part of that is really trying to use social media to make sure that um, we could help them make uh, make connections with college coaches. So, well, well, two things. So since you brought up social media, so um, since a lot of us didn't grow up with social media, sounds like you look at it as being a positive in order to help your players to get in front of the right colleges. How are you ensuring that your athletes are using social media in a positive way as opposed to it being a distraction for them? Um, I, I'm not so much worried about distraction with this generation because I think it is so central to uh, the way they've grown up that it's just different than the way you and I grew up. And, and you know, uh, and so like the old man in me wants to wants to say, you know, just stay off social media. It's not going to happen. You know, it, it's just not like the 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 we're, we're beyond that. Like these, these kids are going to be on there. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we try to monitor our kids. I try to make sure I'm following them on various social media platforms and trying to find all their accounts, you know, because some uh, many of them have several accounts and they have the one they give coach and then they have the other one that they send the other stuff out on. And so, you know, try to try to follow so I can see what's going on um, and then and, and make sure that they um, that they understand there's a purpose for this account. Um, and so, you know, we'll talk about what, what are those what are those purposes um, in particular for recruiting, but also for branding and those kinds of things, um, you know, the, the kids kids want to get their image out there and they want to they want to be able to promote uh, their highlights and show the things that they that they've done well. And um, I think that's all that's all positive um, as far as that. We just have to make sure that that there's a, that there's a structure to it. Um, and I certainly have, you know, some stories for them from college coaches about uh, what happens if you go down the, the wrong road and you make make, make posts that uh, you really don't want out there. Uh, it can certainly impact you down the road. Well, and the thing that I love the most is that you have gotten to the level that you're at and you haven't played professional, not professionally, but at the college level. Does that ever come up? Because a lot of time what I hear is that in order to help somebody, you have to have done what they've done. You know, in order to, to help a wide receiver, you have to have been a wide receiver. So how have you been able to have the success that you've had but yet you didn't necessarily play, you know, college football. Because I think it's a tremendous encouragement to the people out there who, like I said, they, they wanted to be a coach, but maybe they didn't play at the college level. But I feel like you're an encouragement to everybody. <laughs> well, I, I'll say this. Um, there are a lot of really fantastic athletes that can't coach. Don't, they, don't, they don't know how to teach what they, what they do, uh, you know. I had a player um, years ago that uh, made a fantastic move. He's a wide receiver, made a fantastic move off the line, took one step backwards because the defensive back was right in his face, and he was able to create enough space to escape the jam, and he gets by uh, untouched. And, uh, you know, I, I put it up on film in front of the team, and I call the player out, and I said, why did you do this? And he stands up, and he smiles, and he says, I don't know. And that was it. Like he couldn't explain. He didn't understand. He just naturally knew what to do and did it. But um, that wasn't I thought it was going to be great. He was going to teach all these other receivers this this thing that he knew. And I don't even think he really knew it so much as he felt it. And and so, you know, as a coach, it's one thing for me to sort of understand what I need to do. But the real the real meat and potatoes of it is how can I explain it to this this player in a way that that he's going to be able to understand it and put it into practice um, and so I, I really think in a lot of ways they're they're different skill sets um, you know and there's some coaches that were that were great players and they've, they've turned out to be really good coaches uh, but it is, it is definitely not always the case that, that that's it I think it's more about uh, communication and um, willingness to sort of study and learn. And I think this goes back to a little boy when you wanted to be a psychiatrist, right? Um, helping people and teaching them 
So how you do anything is how you do everything. So that skill set that was in you, it sounds like you brought that to the coaching field. Well, I try to. Uh, you certainly want to be be helpful. Uh, you, you know, certainly we don't do this for the money. You know, we don't we don't get paid a ton uh, as high school football coaches. Um, and so if you if you start looking at your hourly rate and you're doing this for money, you're you're in the wrong field. You know, you you could you could go work fast food and do a lot better as an hourly at, a, at an hourly rate than I'm doing coaching. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do it to have a positive impact on people, um, you know, and so hopefully, you know, in addition to having fun and getting to be competitive and all those things that sort of, you know, drive me from within, uh, you want to make sure that that you're leaving your players better than they were when they came into your program. So what would you say are your top, you know, three to five goals for this fall for for the team? Uh, well, I, I mean, the number one thing is to uh, is to is to build the the kind of community and and relationships uh, that we're going to be able to draw on down the road. Uh, you know, moments of crisis will come. I mean, you know, in in the scheme of the world, uh, they're not really crises, but in in the scheme of football, they are. You know, there's going to be those difficult moments. Um, and so to, to build a culture where we can communicate through those things uh, and there's trust to guide one another through those things uh, would, would be sort of the, the first and foremost um, goal. Um, and, and, and I've said for a long time, I really think you can judge the success of a season, you know, four or five years down the road a lot better than you can as soon as that season ends. Um, because you, you see what kind of lasting impact that you've had on on your players. Um, you know, as far as on field, you know, we have a talented group and I think we can do things um, football wise at, at manual that haven't been done in a number of years. I, I'm I'm super excited. I don't mean to to sort of downplay that. Like uh, I think I think we can take this program to sort of new levels um, and I'm, I'm super excited about all that stuff. Uh, but when, when we get to the, the end of my career and I look back, it's, it's going to be uh, the relationships and the impact that we've had. You know, are, are these young uh, men that have played for me, are they better husbands and fathers and brothers uh, than they were or than they would have been if they hadn't played for me? Uh, that, that's how you measure success. Yeah, that, that's really good. I, I think that there's not enough focus on the teamwork, because a lot of times you'll get, and this is more probably at, at a basketball aspect at the college level, you know, you've got all this talent, but in terms of playing as a team and you have to get along with one another, you have to have this team camaraderie in order to, you know, somebody's got a rebound. We can't all be shooters. And just, just figuring out that rhythm or that balance that you were saying is it, tricky. How, what are some things that you would suggest? Because since you're very, um, relationships, team-minded. What if there's a, a coach out there that's struggling with with their team? What are some suggestions that you would give to to him or her? Well, I, you know, I'll go back to the idea that that I wasn't an outstanding football player. Um, I needed to know that I had a role on the team and what my role was. Uh, it, it may be that your role is to go and, and score points and, and be the center of attention. Uh, it may be that your role is to add energy. Uh, it may be that you're a great scout team player um, and that you can give your team a good look. But I think every player in your program should have a pretty good understanding uh, of what their role is and how they're helping to build um, what you're putting together. And that's difficult because everybody wants to be a starter. Everybody wants to be the star. Uh, and so, you know, but but I think where you lose kids is when they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. They don't know how they're helping the 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 group. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, even those kids that aren't your star kids, um, you want to be maximizing those kids. You know, you're, you're in football. We've got 11 guys on the field that 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 ninth, 10th, 11th guy. You need to make that kid the best player he can be so that he's not letting down the other guys. Um, and, um, you know, that that next group that are going to be your scout team guys, those guys are super important. And they have to understand that just because they're not the ones on the field and in the highlights, like 
they help produce that moment. You know, when that defensive, when that safety makes the right read and drives on the ball and makes a tackle at the line, it's because they had a good look in practice on Wednesday. I did that, you know, and, and they need to feel pride in um, that they've contributed to the success of the group, not just they're standing on the sideline cheering for the other guys. Um, and so, you know, as far as building culture, uh, to me, that's the biggest thing that you can do is make every player feel like they have an important role um, and that, that they're contributing to the success of the group. Yeah, that that's just drop the mic on that. That was that was really good. That was really good. So if we were going to put a bow on this entire conversation, what is it that you would want, you know, the athlete to walk away with as well as, you know, coaches out there? I, I would just say, you, you know, it's easy for us to get caught up in um, our day to day um, competitive nature. I have it. We all have it. We want to be the best all the time. Um, but uh, for me, like, I, I think that, that we have to look at why we play these why we play these games. You know, when it comes down to its game. Why am I devoting so many hours to this game? Um, and, you know, it's about putting together that that group and uh, about building people who are are successful in a variety of ways about building a community. You know, I always talk to our freshmen as they come in, you know, when you're going to enter a big high school, there's a lot of kids in there, uh, but you're going to have a, a group of friends before you ever get to the first day of school um, that, that are going to look out for you and protect you and those kinds of things. That, that sense of community, that sense of belonging, I think is really, really important. Um, and so, you know, for me, that's that's a big part of why I do what I do. Yeah, community and belonging. Yeah, I love that. So, Coach, thank you so much for coming on the Dana Spencer Show. So many nuggets, and I definitely will be in the stands this year and rooting on, especially at the Mail Manual game as well. But thank you so much for all that you've done, all that you've had to work at and to learn to, to be in the position that you are today. A tremendous amount of success to you and kudos to your wife as well be sure and tell her you know she's a great wife and to keep asking those thought-provoking questions i absolutely will thank you for having me oh you're welcome until next time on the dana spencer show make sure that you establish a community within your team as well as make sure everyone on the team has a sense of belonging until next time 